Hey, greetings from Arusha, Tanzania. This is yours truly, one uh, Mr. Panuka. Um, some of the insights that uh, we've, you know, just picked up from, you know, the rags one, um, you know, few days right here in Arusha, uh, is around, you know, pest, you know, management, um, you know, as well as, you know, just some fatigation, you know, tips. Uh, so in this video, um, I just provide you some, you know, tidbits right from the experts you know for your benefit uh those of you that could not be here uh in person so again uh hopefully this you know uh, knowledge you know transfer and sharing uh will be beneficial you know for you so without you know further ado let's dive in into the video and hear uh from the experts on you know various you know aspects related to fertigation um and also uh pest you know management for trips well, I can say it's a pest of concern. It is an economic pest, eh? and it's a very difficult to manage insect. And the reason why it's a very difficult to manage insect is because of its behavior. You know, it's a very small insect that a farmer sometimes you cannot see with your eyes unless you have a better lens. But for agronomists, they can easily tell um, the presence of trips through the damage. But you don't always want farmers to approach trips from the damage perspective because it means you are not proactive. Um, so apart from being very small insect that you cannot easily see, it's, um, it has a very short life cycle. And I'll give you some manual here so that you can also learn more about the pest. Uh, it's a small life uh, cycle, short life cycle of about seven days. So moving from egg, larvae, pupa, and of course the adult stage, it can take only seven days. And one most dangerous thing about this pest trip is that one female can lay up to 300 eggs. So if the life cycle is 10 days and one female is doing 300 eggs, so you can imagine if you have 100 trips in your greenhouse at the beginning of the season. So the levels after seven days will be millions and millions. So after one month, it will be something different, crazy. That's why it's very difficult to manage pests because they have very short life cycles. The very important thing that you need to know also about trips when it comes to understanding the enemy is the fact that um, they love the sense of touch. Yeah? They, their behavior, we call it thickmo, taxis behavior. So they want their bodies to always be in touch of the surface of the, the leaf or the flower. So in layman's language, it means they tend to hide. So you don't always find them roaming around the plant. So they are always hidden within the plant. And most of the chemicals that you use to manage trips needs contact. Eh? They are all con most of them are contact. Actually, more than 90% are contact. I'm here to see the systemic product for the trips. So that means um, for you to be very efficient in terms of the management of trips, you need to find a way to bring them out when you are spraying a contact chemical because the chances of a chemical coming into contact with these trips which are hiding is very minimal. That's why most of the chemicals they give you up to 30%, 40% efficacy. If you are a smart farmer to investigate the efficacy of the chemical molecule that you are using. So having known that, you also need to find strategies too and I'll tell you which strategy will you use it to bring them out so that they can be exposed to chemicals. Another thing which you need to know about trips which makes it very difficult to control is that they have diurnal habits. Diurnal habits in the sense that they come out twice in a day to feed between 9 and 11, that is when they are active. They come out to, to cause the damage on the plant. And of course, between 3 p.m. and 5 p.m. So anytime outside those ranges, they are nowhere to be seen, they are hiding. Then we always ask our farmer, when do we spray? Do we spray within these diurnal, you know, these hours? And most of the farmers, we do it uh, facetly, depending on the availability of the workers and, uh, and the like. So sometimes you don't achieve that efficiency in the, or the efficacy of the of the chemical. And then the most just, uh, dangerous part of the, this enemy is the fact that they develop resistance easily to chemical molecules. So you can do a spray of a certain molecule, maybe spinoterum or spinosad. If you do a repeat application, of course, that mode of action will start um, uh, inducing resistance to the pest. You know, there is a way a pest will fight an enemy. Yeah, so when you expose a pest to a certain uh, chemical molecules, they will start changing, you know, mutating their DNA and everything, telling themselves, look, this is an enemy, so what are you doing to fight against the enemy? So they they develop um, they develop that resistance that I'm, that I'm uh, talking about. So having understood that, the behavior of this pest, knowing the circle is very short, knowing the, the, the more taxis behavior, knowing the resistance, knowing the diurnal habit, 
then how do you approach the management of the pest? So as Copat, we tell farmers, this is part of the knowledge now, that you need to you look at it from a holistic approach. You look at the every stage of the pest because the adult lays eggs inside the tissues of, of the plant. So when the egg is hatching to move to the next level, is when now they start getting out of the leaf as they cause the damage. So the egg basically is inside the tissues of the leaf. So that makes that's another thing also which makes uh, trips to be very difficult to manage uh, to manage first. So how do you approach it when it comes to the management? So first thing I've said integrated management approaches. You know you have to start with cultural practices. You know the religious practices that you do. Have a clean you know weed your farm. Don't have many weeds and things like that. If you see a damage you know leave remove it you know because it form it completes a circle there. Yeah. Then the second one apart from the cultural practice of course. You really need to have uh, ticket tops for the mechanical. First one, eh? We, uh, it's ticket tops. This is something that you know from your country. I believe they're in your country, okay? Yeah. So this is the 30 percent. It will give you the first step towards management of trips, and it can give you up to 30 percent control, okay? Mm. Yes, 30 percent control. So most of the people they use it to do monitoring, you know, you know, because by the fact that they are very small insects and they tend to hide, you know, when you're doing your scouting or your farm manager is doing scouting, they they face a lot of difficulties when they're doing scouting. But now with this, it makes their work very easy. So when you use it for monitoring. The, um, its role is just to know the threshold, like how many trips are you seeing or are you encountering per day, you count. If the numbers are crazy, then it tells you, you need to adjust your program, the spray program. So this is a very good tool for scouting and of course it's a very good tool for mass traffic, okay? So trips are attracted to yellow and of course blue color. Yellow um, color, mostly, if it is in the protected crop, but if it's outside, they are more, mostly attracted to, uh, to the, the outside is blue color, but inside you have to integrate both blue and yellow because it serves the purpose, okay? So when you do one card by 10 square meters, that is, you are headed to 30% management of trips, but this is now the adult stage, something that is crawling or, you know, jumping uh, towards it, okay? That is one. So I've said this is for uh, very good control. So if you don't have this, of course, you are not interfering with the life cycle of the pest. Because if you trap the adult, it means you are preventing them from laying the 300 eggs that I mentioned at the beginning of my at the beginning of my presentation. So the second category or the second product that we uh, encourage farmers is now to integrate the chemical molecules with some of the beneficial fungus. Eh? So like in copper. We position Duveria. I don't know if you've ever heard of a beneficial fungus. Eh? It's a bioinsecticide. A fungus that inoculates or infects trips upon application. Okay? It's called Duveria Passiana. The product is called Duveria. I don't know if you've ever heard of Duveria Passiana. I'm talking about the active ingredient. If it is there in some way. Yes, there. It's there. Okay. So Duveria Passiana is also very good, but only if you apply correctly. Okay? Mm -hmm. If you apply correctly, because High humidity activates the fungus to start uh, germinating or developing the mycelia and spores, which can now infect the, the trip in this case. So you need to ensure that in the, in, if it's a protected uh, house, you need to have uh, that sufficient humidity, about 60, 45 and above percentage. And sometimes we tell farmers, how do you achieve this? You, know, you can apply during the very day that you are doing irrigation. So that, because irrigation creates some humidity within the and of course, we advise application of the same Puveria Passiana in the evening, so that, because it takes only six hours, six to eight hours to be activated, so that it can grow, develop spores, and now infect the trips. Okay, I'm insisting that because most of you know, if you use Puveria Passiana the way you think, then it might not give you the, the, the best results. But if you use it in a condition that it favors the growth of this fungus, then it gives you the best results. It's like going to war. If you don't understand about your enemy. Where do you attack from? Yeah? The same way, we try as much as possible to encourage agronomists to understand, at least get a basic understanding of how the pest or the disease behaves. And that even when you're recommending a solution, it's something that um, is the most effective way of managing it. So drips is one of those pests you say are polyphagous. Polyphagous means they eat many species of plants. 
So you'll have your cucumber in the crop, but if you have some weeds there, they'll be happy being there. So you could be spraying your cucumber. If your greenhouse is not, hygiene is not the best, you'll be running to the weeds. Once the spray is done, you go back to the cucumber. Yeah? So hygiene now comes in there. How clean is your environment? That way you deny them as much, as many hosts as possible, so that where you hit them is where you, they have nowhere to run to. And of course, there's a big concern about their ability to, to control or to be a vector or a carrier of viruses. Maybe you can just talk about this a bit. Thrips is not thrips. There are so many species of thrips. There are very many species of thrips, all of them with very unique behaviors. <coughs> yeah? Don't mind about the scientific names. Um, that one there is what we call the Western Flower Drips, that's the Onion Drips, the Kino Drips and the Americano, the Kino Drips and the Drips Citosis are more, they're coming in with the exports or the imports. For example, people growing flowers, when you bring, they are more in Europe, so if you bring in your planting material from Europe, if you're not in the lookout, you want to bring that to your pool of drips. The thing is, the life cycle is the same regardless of the, of the species. But this life cycle, why we need to learn about it is it's not like any other insect. This is one insect that is so dynamic that if you don't know how it behaves, you will spray forever. Why? The moment they get the adults, so they are flying adults. So this guy will get through even the tiniest hole that is in that greenhouse. Some places you go, a farmer tells you, I have a drift snake. And drips are just crawling in. Yeah? So, if you can manage physical protection, it helps a lot. Because then you, you reduce the influxes of what is coming from outside. But it's never enough. Once this guy gets into the greenhouse, for most of the insects, the way they are wired, because we've been trying to kill them the last 100 years, is they are wired to survive. So when you a drips, an adult gets into a greenhouse, they are not even interested to eat. For them, it's, this is a nice place to put their next generation. So they will lay as many eggs as they can. So one female drips can give even 300 eggs. Because they want to have as many babies in this nice crop that you're growing. So from there, you have the eggs. Where do drips put their eggs? Drips will put their eggs inside the leaves. So they open the leaf like an envelope and put it in there. So there is no chemical known to kill the eggs of drips. So when that one passes you, know that just know you have drips and you're gonna wait for them to be to be larvids or the young ones. So the young ones, how they are wired again is they feed, feed and feed. So they can grow quickly and get to the next stage before you kill them. So this is the most damaging stage of drips. So if you're interested with the life cycle and you go check your crop and all you're finding is the babies, just do your damage of the crop will be just be exponential. So they are feeding every moment of their life. So after about five days, these guys will become a dormant stage that normally hides mostly in the media. If the greenhouse is not so clean, that's a very nice place to hide. In the debris down there. So they'll be there for another three or so days, then they come back as adults and the life cycle continues. Again, it brings us back to the IPM. What are those things you can add into your management to help your good chemicals work? So like he's told us, he's said a very good point. These guys are in the soil. What can you do about them? Because if you do something about it, then your overall management plan is likely going to work. I don't know whether people understood what we said. Yeah. Maybe? Uh, Please share yeah. the knowledge again. Yeah, uh, to deter these guys, pupa stage, to go to a place that you can cover during sprays, you can use some pyrethrin. We call it in Chile maybe flower dust but the real active ingredient is... It's palladium dust, so yes. like a repellent. It makes them uncomfortable. Yes. So after you apply it downwards on your traps, on the areas that you know there is likely to be 
hiding points and your hygiene is good, at least uh, inside and outside your prison, then you can do sprays to eradicate them on the upper part of your cell. Principle of tutor. We don't wait when to come into the greenhouse and establish a life cycle. We put in the sticky traps in advance. Once you plant your tomatoes, plant your capsicum, put in the sticky traps. Mm -hmm. What you've done is any drip, any white fly, so fly into that greenhouse, will land on the traps. So in our experience as corporate, if you are use these guys properly, yeah, if you use the traps properly, they can give you between 30 40 percent control of trips. Then you can think about the other portion of what you do. But it's your first line of defense when it comes to the flying, flying insects. Um, so we have two types of the traps. There's what we call the sticky cuts. These are small cuts that are quite flexible in terms of how you can place them. And we have the big rod. These are about 100 meters. So you can chop it into pieces and fix it in the greenhouse. Um, one thing you need to know is people promote these two products the same way. And maybe no one will ever tell you this. Never use this for drips. The reason being, uh, if you look at this material, this is, this is just a polymer. Yeah? But I'll open this. This is a hard cut. So the quality of glue here versus what you can have on this polythene is very different, even in terms of handling. Also, if you look at the materials, they are different. Okay? So what happens is, um, drips are able to jump out of roller traps. So you can have them in the greenhouse, they look nice, but drips will be coming there, but they can easily jump out if they wish. So you find actually when you put in rolls, those areas that are, the crops that are near these rolls may be more damaged than where you don't have the rolls. So for drips, we really recommend using the, the cut because the glue and the material is hard enough to, ma to control drips. For the soft insects or for the light insects, leaf miners, uh, white flies, Aphids, you can easily trap them with the rolls. And this, when if it's not everything you're talking about, is a very good defense for all those pests. Aphids, white flies, make miners. When they land here, they reduce your need to spray. So how many of these do you need in an acre or in a greenhouse? So they, we have a general recommendation. So of one sticky card, the working area is about 10 square meters. So whatever area you have divided by 10, that's the number of sticky cards that you need. So that's one tool or one solution we've just talked about. So for example, the chemical solutions. Again, drips is a very funny insect that if you look at how it behaves, it will hide in the flowers, hide in all the corner places it can find. So you are likely going to spray, but they will never come into contact with your chemical. So over time, people have learned some tricks to, to trick it. Like he's using neem to pull them out of the ground. You can use sugar, just a normal sugar, with your, with your insecticide to sweeten it, because they love, they love glucose. So they'll come out to take the glucose and you, they're going to hit them with the chemical. So if you're not, there's a product in copper we call a tracker. It's designed for that. It's a really good product, but before you get it in your country, you can also try either molasses or table sugar. It does the same job. You just sprinkle them. In no, no, no. Mix it in the spray. solution, spray solution. Okay. You have your bamaktin, you have your tracer. Put in uh, sugar in there. And mm. spray on the floor. Of the no, no, no. Spray on the crop. On the, the crop, crop itself. Yeah. Flow comes from. Okay. What happens is you will pull it from this flower. So they will be so excited that there is some sugar out here, but what you're doing is you're tricking them to come into contact with the chemical. Yeah. 
So on average, if your best chemical gives you 70% control, you do that, you can find you are now achieving 90%. Yeah, so effective. It's effective, right? Oh. Organic certified solutions only. Now the challenge with organic is sometimes when you find pests are going above threshold, uh, the corrective solutions that are there, say of pesticides, they are not strong enough to restore balance. And that's why sometimes an organic crop at some point you're gonna lose control of it in terms of pest management because you don't have enough tools to keep that crop under control. And biological, you are allowed to use even effective chemicals, but of course in a reasonable and sustainable way. That's the difference. And the good thing is a lot of the biologicals are organic registered because most of them are from nature, they're natural. But of course, always check with your accreditor about their list. It's on paper. Spray no pad out there. And this is 24 hours later. The contractor is collapsed. That's what I'm explaining. It's all gone. It's controlled. That's one use of no pad, and the rest is there. Yeah? At least two times, we've cleaned our soil. Then we think about how do we introduce beneficial fungus that will be protective to the plant the rest of the season. And that's where the trianum comes in. So that way you clean up and put in a biological defense system. And this is a system I can tell you that we have uh, commercial growers in Kenya who have shifted 100% from chemicals, the carbendazines, the prefixures, the metallurgies you're talking about, to this, sustainable. Alright, thank you so much. Um, hope, you know, that video was very informative for you. Um, it's been lovely, you know, for us. And I uh, hope you actually picked up, you know, uh, one or two, you know, tidbits uh, from this, you know, uh, few days that we've had for the last, um, you know, two days. So from the hydroponics, you know, unit, saying, have a lovely one. This has been yours truly. Mr. Panuka from Arusha, Tanzania. Bye-bye.